Um, so Professor Chomsky is here obviously to answer your questions. Without more ado, I would, I'm not very good at press conferences, um, just throw it open to the floor and you can take a pop at uh, the man I believe is the world's most quoted academic. Most vilified is the right <laughs> word. Okay, it's up to you. Um, Professor Chomsky, I was wondering uh, uh, what's your opinion on such um, overly populist left-wing agitators uh, such as Michael Moore are, and whether they're of any remote help in, in America today? Well, I don't exactly know what overly populist means. He's uh, trying to reach the general public, that's for sure. Uh, yeah, I think he's had a very significant effect. Uh, not I don't know if it's the left. He reaches a general audience. And just out of curiosity, my, I don't see films much, but uh, my wife and I went to watch uh, Bowling for Columbine and went purposely to a sort of lower middle class, working class neighborhood where we see what the react, more interested in the reaction than in the film. And it was interesting. I mean, in a way he was mocking their beliefs and commitments, but it was a pretty enthusiastic audience, uh, whether because it wasn't entirely clear whether it was because they were regarding it as uh, satire and not meaningful, or whether they resonated to what uh, he was saying. But he certainly has, has reached a very wide audience, and not particularly the left, which he's not talking to, the, not to be told that they don't like guns. but. Uh, and of course, there's a backlash. So uh, across the spectrum of uh, educated opinion from what's called left in the United States, like the New York Times, uh, which recently was uh, described as the most left-wing institution on the face of the earth by the president's uh, economic advisor, a distinguished economist from Harvard. Uh, the, uh, so from the New York Times over to the far right, there's a, uh, they exploit his, uh, they exploit him as a, uh, a way of kind of undermine uh, anything he's speaking for. Actually, that's true in England too. I don't read the English press regularly, of course, but I did happen to be here uh, last May when the Cannes Festival was going on, and I did one or came close to winning a prize. And it was a long interview with him in one of the British journals, maybe the Independent, I don't recall, which is a rather derisive uh, interview. I don't recall the author, but uh, uh, in it he made the standard accusations that Moore lies and he's not trustworthy and so on. And the proof that he lies, the main proof that he lies, uh, which is kind of interesting, is that he claims to have come from a working class background, but his father uh, owned the house and owned the car, so he's lying. His father was an auto worker, and he's claiming to come from a working class background, which tells you something about, not about him, but about England, uh, and about the way the notion of class has been uh, eliminated from consciousness. So if a person's working class, he's not working class uh, if he happens to own a car, which every steel worker does. Uh, but uh, that's pretty standard, the kind of derision of his uh, somewhat class-based and somewhat populist critique. What the overall effect is, it's hard to say, because the propaganda is all on the other side. So what reaches uh, readers of the press and people who watch television and so on is the uh, derision and the uh, uh, fabrication about his uh, his uh, untrustworthiness and so on. On the other hand, he reached a lot large audience. So it's a mixed, mixed effect. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Idris? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Jones, I wanted to ask about the Geneva Accords. You have uh, recently um, endorsed them. And uh, I, I was wondering, I mean, how do you see them as being any different from what you call the apartheid solution of the peace process, considering that uh, the right of return is given away, yet the settlements are not dismantled either. And, uh, and more importantly, even the resources in terms of water and all these important resources, I mean... Well, that's not quite true. The, uh, 
First of all, I wouldn't have called the peace process, the, uh, it's unclear what you mean by the peace process, but if what you mean is the international consensus of the last uh, roughly 30 years uh, on a two-state settlement on the international border, uh, if that's what you mean by the peace process, then uh, the Geneva Accords are a fairly pro close approximation to it. So I didn't endorse them, but I suggest it is that they are a very appropriate basis for negotiation, which is why the United States unilaterally and alone opposes them. Palestinians support them, uh, Israeli doves support them, the Europe supports them, the uh, U.S. has blocked them, and so therefore they're out of discussion. Uh, but they're a, a sort of a natural evolution of the uh, negotiations that have been going forward towards some sort of settlement roughly in accord with the international consensus. Uh, the actual proposals at the Geneva Accords, uh, the wording which uh, on the right of return is ambiguous <clears throat> and should be negotiated and I think can be fixed. I don't really think that's the issue because on the right of return there really is no disagreement across the board, at least among the people who care about the refugees. The fact of the matter is the refugees are not going to return to Israel, except for a symbolic number, uh, for quite a long time. I mean, it's possible that the end of a long process of accommodation and interaction and uh, social and political change, there might be a possibility. But in the near term, uh, foreseeable future, it's simply deeply immoral to dangle in front of suffering people the belief that they're going to get something which they're never going to get. There is no international support for the right of return to Israel. There's very little Palestinian support at the political echelons, those who try to be realistic. And if any support ever developed, which is hard to imagine, uh, Israel would use its ultimate weapons to prevent it, uh, meaning it, there'd be nobody left. Okay. So therefore, to tell the refugees uh, we're going to help you get the right of return is simply deeply immoral. It's not a proper way to deal with the f suffering of people who are really living in misery. Uh, they should not abandon the right of return. I think that's correct. Uh, just as the people who uh, used to live where I live and were mostly exterminated by Scotch uh, Irish uh, colonists uh, they have a right of return too, but they're not going to achieve it. Uh, so the right of return is legitimate, but uh, implementation of the right is a different question. Could happen over a long period, but if we're serious, it's not going to. It can't be an, uh, an option for uh, negotiation now. The serious issue is the territorial one. Where's the boundaries? And on that, the Geneva Accords come closer to uh, the. Uh, international consensus than uh, anything so far. I mean, they're the first ones that call for a, a, a moderately serious one-to-one -one land swap, which means a settlement roughly on the border with some give either way. Uh, and that's, uh, that's actually the proposals, the, these are the proposals that have been on the international agenda for 30 years. Uh, PLO accepted them, the Arab states accepted them, just reiterated them a couple of days ago, uh, Europe, uh, Latin America, essentially everyone. Uh, the, uh, they're not perfect, you know, but, uh, 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 but, but as a basis for negotiations, I think they're very sensible, which is precisely why the United States and Israel unilaterally reject them. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, having spent some time in the UK, do you think it's more a part of the European community or more an extension of America or almost another American state? That's up to Europeans. I mean, you've got your fate in your own hands. You know, Europe is a powerful part of the world. It's uh, comparable to the United States or beyond it in just about every dimension except military force, which really doesn't matter in most of these issues. Uh, so it's up to uh, Europeans whether they would like to be uh, uh, sort of dependent clients of uh, U.S. military power or whether they would like to join the large majority of American public opinion, which happens to be strongly opposed to just about every policy of the U.S. government. If you look at U.S. public opinion, 
it would, it's very similar to European public opinion on just about every issue. Uh, so when you talk about the United States, you're really talking about US, the U.S. bipartisan, very narrow bipartisan media elite consensus, which is very remote from the population. And Europeans have to simply say, well, which America am I interested in? Uh, the America that's in favor of uh, the Kyoto Protocol, that's against the use of force in international affairs, that wants to join the International Criminal Court, that uh, is in favor of uh, spending on uh, uh, social issues and not military and so on. That's the large majority of the population. So Europeans can decide, do I want to be connected with them or do I want to be connected with uh, elite power, which has succeeded in largely marginalizing the population so that the political system is completely dysfunctional. It's a failed state in that respect. And uh, that's, that's a choice that Europeans have to make. I mean, Britain has historically made the choice of being uh, uh, the US attack dog, basically. But, you know, that's a choice, not a necessity. Can I see if anyone else would like to come in for the first time? Sorry. What do you think is the best way forward for the left, considering the amount of propaganda we're up against? Sorry. What do you think is the best way forward for the left, considering the amount of propaganda we're up against? The lack of a mass media outlet to represent the point of view. If you take into account the Iraq War and the uh, misinformation on weapons of mass destruction, human rights abuses, and it's very hard to get your point of view across because the media is so strictly controlled. Expect. Uh you know, the media overwhelmingly are instruments of concentrated private and state power. So they're doing their job. I mean, you should criticize it, but not be surprised by it. I mean, any more than you should be surprised by the fact that uh, a major corporation is trying to raise profits. I mean, yeah, you can say, you can be critical of this, that thing they're doing, but not of their policies. Uh, you can be critical of the existence of the institution, but that's a different matter. Uh, as for what the best way forward for the left is, I think it's uh, to uh, recognize that the left is really the center. Uh, if you take, I'm mean, like my opinions, I suspect probably yours without knowing you, uh, in the United States and in England, uh, I haven't seen polls in England, but I assume it's the same. The United States is very heavily polled, so we know a lot about public opinion. I'm right in the middle of the stream. In fact, in many respects, uh, public opinion goes beyond what I would have said. Uh, I mean, I agree with it, but I wouldn't say it. Like, for example, a majority of the public in the United States uh, thinks that uh, the U.S. ought to give up the veto of the United Nations and follow uh, majority uh, uh, decision. I mean, that is so remote from discussion that, you know, it sounds like it's from Mars. Nobody could say that, uh, or would say it, but it is the majority of the public. And uh, it's the same on other issues. I mean, say, take the Kyoto Protocol, which is just in the news. Uh, you read in the press that, uh, here too, that uh, the United States didn't uh, go along, uh, re rejected the Kyoto Protocols unilaterally. Everyone else agreed. Now, that's true only in a very peculiar sense. Now, if you really despise democracy with uh, passion, it's true. Uh, the U.S. government did vote against it, but the American public is very strongly in favor of it. So if the public is part of the United States, it's not true that the U.S. opposed it. Uh, the public, in fact, is so strongly in favor of it that a majority of Bush voters assumed that he was in favor of it because it's such an obvious thing to be in favor of. Uh, and uh, the same goes through on issue after issue. And take just pure domestic issues. So the federal budget just came out a couple of weeks ago. You go through the federal budget, uh, you know, what it expanded, what it cut, and so on. If you look at public opinion, which is carefully studied, it's exactly the opposite on every issue. Every issue, you run through it. If uh, the budget says X, uh, public says not X. Uh, dramatically. Uh, and uh, in a country where the public has been largely excluded from the political arena, like the United States or England to a large extent, uh, it sort of doesn't matter. You know, and the media don't But that gives lots of opportunities for the left. In fact, these are very optimistic results. 
that says uh, the country is just uh, ready for uh, uh, organizing activities which can uh, re recreate something of a functioning democratic system. And then, you know, it won't, won't be what I want, but it will be a lot better than what exists now. Uh, so there's endless opportunities. But it doesn't make sense to complain about the fact that the media are doing their job, uh, which is to uh, support, to reshape the world in support of the interests of power, which it's part of. I mean, you can be glad that there are journalists like John Pilger and others around who don't do it, but they've got to be at a kind of fringe, almost necessarily for institutional reasons. And, and that's not an insuperable barrier. I mean, for one thing, the, uh, the media are not uh, uninfluenced by public opinion. I mean, even in a totalitarian state, uh, the government has got to respond to public attitudes, just have to. And in much more free societies, that's of course the truth. There's plenty of ways of pressuring the media, and it has effects. And then there are alternatives. And by now, alternatives are not difficult to construct. Uh, contemporary technology, thanks to the Pentagon, uh, allows uh, lots of opportunities for alternative media, which reach plenty of people. Can I ask a two-part question? One, would you like to comment on the fact that the BBC has written, has issued a written apology to the Israeli government for having interviewed Mordechai Vanunu without having previously gone through the military censors? Um, connected with which Vanunu is now the rector of Glasgow University, we think that in a modest way we now have some kind of democratic mandate among one body of students um, for Palestinian human rights and against weapons of mass destruction. Well, the BBC uh, action would be comparable to its having issued an apology to uh, uh, Joseph Stalin for having interviewed a Russian dissident. Say, uh, I think any further comment is necessary about that. It's particularly grotesque in Britain uh, since he was kidnapped in Britain by the Israeli intelligence and taken to Israel and given what didn't even amount to a sham trial. I mean, they didn't even try to pretend it was a trial. Uh, put in prison for 18 years, I think, about 12 of them in solitary confinement, uh, which is pure torture. You know, it's, it's when he got out, I started corresponding with him, and you know, it's amazing that he survived that, but not without problems, of course. And now they're uh, very sadistically, uh, and without any political purpose, uh, restricting him in all kinds of arbitrary ways, including the latest uh, uh, imprisonment for having you know, gone to church somewhere where he's not supposed to go or talk to a foreign journalist or something. Uh, for the BBC to apologize for uh, being willing to talk to him requires no comment. Uh, the Glasgow uh, University uh, uh, decision, student decision, was very important. Actually, at my university, there's now an effort, MIT, an effort to uh, try to award him a fellowship for next year for a human rights program. Uh, and I think many more things of that, can, of that kind can be done to put pressure on, uh, indirectly on Israel, but primarily on our own governments, the ones we can influence, uh, which uh, set very narrow conditions on what Israel can do. I mean, it's very easy to criticize Israel for doing this, that, and the other thing, but it's also very misleading. I mean, they can do precisely nothing unless they're permitted to, permitted by the United States and secondarily uh, Europe. Uh, that sets the bounds within which a small state can operate. Uh, so, and that's, and these are things that we can certainly influence. I mean, here, I, I don't know, I don't, you can't take a poll on Fununa for the simple reason that in the United States, at least, I don't think, you know, one out of a million people have ever heard of them, as distinct from, say, a European, an East European dissident. Uh, but uh, among people who had ever heard of it, there's just total outreach. Uh, and that can be, uh, can be turned into an effective weapon, not only for him personally, but for everything that he represents, which is not just you know, his freedom, but non-proliferation. After all, that's a major issue. It's probably going to wipe out the species.
You know, it's not a minor issue. Uh, and uh, he's a symbol of uh, what the non-proliferation movement ought to be, uh, making sure that the nuclear states don't have nuclear weapons. And you couldn't have a better symbol. So that's, it's, he stands for something of extraordinary importance. In fact, survival of the species is what he stands for. And that's not an exaggeration. Chances of total destruction by nuclear war are reasonably high and increasing. I see who else would like to ask Professor Chomsky a question, so I have some idea of time. He's got a grueling schedule. One, two. Can I, can I ask a question, Noel, uh, about um, the G8 summit in Glen Eagles later this year? Um, in the last few weeks, the Scottish press have particularly have been obsessed with anarchists and demonstrations, and uh, the police have been circulating all sorts of rumours about what might happen, including supposed attacks on the Parliament and all sorts of outrageous. Uh, smears. Uh, and in particular, one of the things the police are saying is that they're going to have access to rubber and plastic bullets, to water cannon imported from Belgium, to thousands of police imported from south of the border. And one of the things that suggests to us, it seems, is that they're trying to frighten away demonstrators uh, from coming to Glen Eagles. Tony Blair has said just the other week in the Sunday Mail that he doesn't know why people will demonstrate against the GA because the entire agenda is for the good of humanity, it's Africa, it's climate change, etc. And I wonder, what would you say in response to that? Do What does what does the movement do? Challenge the media and its reporting, challenge the police, make sure that they try and show that the demonstrations will be peaceful to attract more and more thousands of people, or what? If the past is any guide, and it's the only guide we have, uh, I would suspect that the hysteria about uh, you know, anarchist violence and ring and police and so on is probably provocation. I mean, they like nothing more than to provoke a violent confrontation. That puts the issues off the agenda. Then you don't have to bother with the issues that the protesters are raising, and you can talk about the fact that somebody uh, threw a stone at a bank window. Uh, and in the past, uh, even at, at uh, these demonstrations, but traditionally, a large part of the violence is provoked by is provocateurs, you know, internal, you know, the, in Genoa, for example, the, uh, it turned out that a lot of the uh, violence was just police provocation, internal to the uh, uh, people, you know, who sort of uh, put on uh, anarchist-style uh, clothes and then were discovered a couple of days later at the local police station, and that's quite typical. Uh, not just here, but uh, generally. So, for example, in uh, Algeria in the 1990s, there was tremendous violence attributed to uh, Islamic uh, fundamentalists. But it turned out on investigation that the uh, uh, a typical act of... Actually, there was a study done by uh, expatriate Algerian physicists, some of them, one of them in Oxford, one of them at MIT, which is how I got to know about it, in which they just did a careful analysis of uh, uh, the uh, massacres in Algeria and uh, published a big volume about it, uh, which incidentally was banned in France uh, in the interest of freedom. What they discovered was uh, that the typical massacre would be in a refugee camp uh, where people dressed up as kind of Hollywood versions of an Islamic fundamentalist uh, would come into the camp and uh, spend three days uh, slaughtering everybody. Uh, the camp would be maybe you know a kilometer away from a major military base, but nobody noticed it. Uh, and uh, after the place was wiped out and hundreds of people were killed and so on, uh, six months later, some general would come and buy up the land for you know, 25 cents and uh, build a fancy tourist hotel or something like that. And it also turned out that French intelligence was involved directly. France never gave up Algeria. They just tried to reconstruct their control of it in other ways, uh, economic, political, and uh, the standard devices of Western society. England pioneered it, in fact. Uh, intelligence and security penetration to carry out provocation and so on. Well, that's been typical of the uh, of big demonstrations forever. I remember it very well in the 1960s. In the 1960s, I was involved very much in organizing resistance. Uh, and the resistance groups were you know, not 
really invested in any deep way, but we did things that we didn't want publicly known. But every group knew, very, learned very quickly, that you cannot have, uh, you can't decide, talk about anything serious in a meeting which includes, uh, say, seven or eight people, because one or two of them will be a, a, an informer. So everything serious that had to be done was always done with affinity groups, you know, small groups of people who know each other, and, you know, you can trust each other and so on. And that's true on just about everything. So I'd assume it's very likely true here, too. And the, uh, you know, trying to build up an atmosphere of tension will both tend to provoke the violence that they're hoping for, and if it doesn't, they'll do it themselves. Uh, that's what uh, police provocateurs are for. You know, it's an old tradition of security forces. Uh, what the protest, I mean, Blair's statement is, again, kind of like uh, the BBC apologizing when they talk about it. We know what G8 is. It's not a humanitarian organization. Uh, and the protesters have something very important to say, and they ought to get it across. Uh, one of the methods of preventing them from doing it will be to create an atmosphere of violent confrontation, in which case you can talk about stone throwing and ignore the uh, significant points that are being brought out. But uh, uh, the demonstrators should have their pursue their own agenda. Actually, this is extremely typical of lots of, and there's a long history of this. You take a look at the whole history of uh, uh, external imperialism or internal domestic control. So it always, almost always, turns into a matter of a confrontation between uh, two kinds of strength. You know, one is political strength, the other is uh, military strength. Uh, the imperial powers had military strength, but not political strength. That's in the hands of the population. Uh, domestically, and uh, whether it's union organizing or, you know, protests about uh, government policies or whatever. It's the public that has political strength. It's the power centers that have uh, the means of violence. And that just extends to almost everything. And it means that a very natural, you know, the proper tactic for those in power is to try to shift everything to the arena of violence, because that's where they're strong. And the proper tactic for everyone else is to shift matters to the uh, uh, to the domain of uh, issues and uh, uh, principles and so on, because that's where they're strong. And I suspect that what you're describing is just the preliminary stages of trying to shift the entire uh, event to the domain of uh, violence, where, of course, state power is overwhelming, and to shift it away from the arena of uh, debate and discussion where state power is very weak and have to expect it and react to it. Can I ask two? Um, would, you, would you believe, uh, as uh, the media said, uh, um, Lebanon is moving steadily towards freedom and prosperity and uh, democracy? Freedom, prosperity, and democracy. And democracy. We have a couple hundred years of history looking right up to the present. I mean, they're not opposed to it. Like, for example, uh, traditionally, say, the United States and England and France and others uh, have supported uh, democracy at home and abroad as long as it's under control. So it's better to have uh, formal democracy in which uh, people cast votes and that sort of thing. Uh, but uh, only as long as they're excluded from political decision making. And that's been the struggle in the more free and democratic societies for hundreds of years. I mean, the, uh, take, say, England. Uh, England became a formally more or less democratic society about a hundred years ago. Uh, that's when you started getting parliamentary labor parties and uh, mass suffrage and uh, some degree of participation in the uh, political system. And the reaction was a very strong reaction to say, well, we can't stop this anymore. We can't break it down by violence. Uh, so we have to figure out ways of accommodating it. Uh, that's when, uh, for example, when the public relations industry began. And it's striking that it, it developed 
in the United States and in England, the two freest countries in the world. And, it, and in both countries, it developed very consciously, you know, you read it in its literature, as a way of dealing with the fact that people can't be controlled by force anymore. Uh, you can't break up uh, union organizing by police violence, it's going beyond that. And you can't stop uh, parliamentary labor parties and so on. So the, you have to shift to uh, 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 controlling attitudes and opinions by other means. So you get these huge industries devoted to trying to control attitudes and opinions and uh, atomize people and marginalize them and so on and so forth. So that kind of democracy. And, and then a struggle goes on. Are we going to have real democracy? Are we going to have elite uh, uh, decision making uh, and popular ratification? Uh, what political scientists call polyarchy, uh, which is what England and the United States are and other countries. Uh, so that's domestically and internationally it's the same thing. I mean, they're, they're not opposed to prosperity as long as the uh, people who matter, uh, the rich and powerful, get what they need. Then it's kind of irrelevant whether other people can survive. I mean, if they can, okay, if not gonna, there's no opposition to it. Uh, but policies are naturally designed in the interests of the policy makers. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, that's the whole of history. It's nothing. Is Lebanon moving towards the. Uh, well, moving towards what? No, <coughs> and the Middle East in general. The well, Middle East, like every other part of the world, for years, decades, I mean, the Middle East has been moving towards democracy. So if you go back, uh, say, to the 1950s, uh, in, in 1958, it's a very crucial year in world affairs, and Middle East affairs particularly. Uh, we know from in, in, the United States is a very free country, it's the most free in the world. We have huge uh, access to internal planning records, declassified documents, and so on. So in principle, you can know a lot about what happened. Part of the job of the media and educated sectors is to prevent the population from knowing it, but it's there. Uh, and what you find is that in 1958, the Eisenhower administration uh, had three major foreign policy crises. Uh, one of them was uh, Indonesia, one was North Africa, and the other was the Middle East. Uh, incidentally, all Islamic and critically all oil producers, which was the real issue. And in each case, democracy was a serious issue. Uh, in Indonesia, uh, there was a uh, it was a post-colonial society, and it was developing parliamentary forms. Uh, and the, the government was simply too democratic. It was permitting a party of the poor to participate in elections. And it was winning uh, a lot of political power. It looked like it might even become a majority. And uh, the Indonesian military and the United States uh, agreed that uh, uh, if they couldn't be controlled, there would have to be a military coup to destroy them. That was 1958, and in fact, Eisenhower ran the biggest clandestine operations in American post-war history up until Nicaragua to try to uh, support a military coup which would take over the outer islands where all the resources are and keep them under U.S. control. Uh, that didn't work, and then they turned to supporting the military and ended up with the Suharto coup, and that took care of democracy. They massacred maybe a million people, most of them from the party of the poor, no problems with democracy anymore. Uh, that's when uh, you know, England, for example, just reacted with utter euphoria, as the United States did about this great achievement. So, uh, so that took care of Indonesia. Uh, in North Africa, the problem was Algeria. Algerian independence, which is another manifestation of uh, popular efforts to take control of your own lives. Well, that sort of got finessed in some fashion when a formal Algerian independence was granted. Uh, in the Middle East, the problem was uh, uh, that Iraq, which had been a British dependency ever since the British created it in the early 20s, uh, broke out of the Anglo-American condominium over energy production, which is crucial for world control. Iraq had a sort of a populist coup, which is a big problem. 
uh, if there was they thought it was England and the United States reacted with complete hysteria. Uh, the, uh, the British Foreign Minister, Selwyn Lloyd, flew to Washington, uh, discussions with John Foster Dulles, and they decided that, uh, uh, well, their actual decision was that, uh, their exact words, that if, if uh, that for one thing they decided was to grant the British colony of Kuwait nominal independence. So like it could have its own post office, and that kind of thing. Uh, to try to uh, restrict the threat that uh, independent nationalism might spread. Uh, but if anything went wrong, for whatever reason, internal to Kuwait or anything else, uh, the uh, British would intervene, as they said, ruthlessly to suppress it, uh, because the British economy relied quite heavily on Kuwaiti investments and oil resources. So Britain would intervene ruthlessly to suppress any move in Kuwait towards anything, you know, internal. That's a part of the background of the invasion of 1991. And the United States accepted the same right, ruthlessly to intervene uh, in the big oil producers, you know, it's the relative role of the U.S. and England uh, in Saudi Arabia and the Emirates and so on. Uh, and the point was to try to prevent the spread of secular nationalism which was symbolized by Nasser. And what they were really concerned about was that the Nasserite pressures would try to use the resources of the region, which are immense, for their own populations, instead of the way it's supposed to work, for the wealth of Western corporations and local elites who work with them. Uh, and well, that problem was taken care of by the Israeli, uh, uh, by the 1967 war, which destroyed Nasser and made Israel a, you know, just like a beloved client state of the West for having achieved it. And that's the relation ever since. Uh, but, but if you look back, that's 1958. And the concern in all three areas was too much pressure toward democracy in the Middle East. And they were aware of it. So for example, Eisenhower in 1958 discussed with his staff secretly uh, what he called uh, the campaign of hatred against us in the Arab countries. And they discussed why, and the National Security Council, the highest planning agency, uh, attributed it to uh, what they said, the perception in the Arab world that the United States is opposed to democracy and development uh, and uh, supports uh, brutal autocratic regimes and military dictatorships. Uh, because uh, the U.S. wants to maintain control over their energy supplies. And they said, well, the perception is essentially accurate, uh, but that's what we ought to be doing. And it continues right up to the present. You know, the studies done right after 9-11 have found essentially the same reactions, and it's precisely the same today. You take a look at every single case, which is called U.S.-British support for democracy, it's actually extremely reluctant accommodation to independent democratic forces, uh, which then you try to shape and modify in some way. I mean, say, take Iraq. You know, I mean, it's so obvious in Iraq that uh, even the editors of the Financial Times describe it accurately, because you just can't miss it. I mean, Britain and the United States were passionately opposed to elections in Iraq and tried in every possible way to block them. But they just couldn't deal with the nonviolent resistance. I mean, they don't really care about the bomb throwers. It's again the usual story. I mean, violence is, this is a near monopoly of violence in the hands of the powerful state. So if it's bomb throwing, okay, they can take care of it. But what they couldn't take care of was the nonviolent resistance, you know, the mass popular refusal to accept the US British efforts to uh, write a constitution to have a caucus system which would evade elections and so on. And, uh, when they finally uh, were forced to agree to it, they of course took credit for it. That's natural again. Uh, and the, then the first thing, that, they didn't waste a second. I mean, the day after the elections, uh, Tony Blair had a major interview with the Financial Times, big full page interview, and she starts off by saying, right away, we're going to subvert the elections. I mean, it's not the words he used, but that's the meaning. 
uh, he was asked, the first question he was asked in the interview was, uh, uh, will Britain and the United States uh, uh, present a timetable for withdrawal? And his first comment is, there is no possibility of any timetable for withdrawal. And that was the leading plank of every party in the election. So what Blair was saying, yeah, we were forced to accept elections, but we were going to subvert them. And that's what the headline would have been in any free press in, in the world. And they said the same in Washington. Yeah, so, yeah, we were forced to accept them, can't get around it, but uh, now we've got to subvert them. Uh, and this is the crucial issue. It's not the only one. The other ones are whether uh, the U.S. and Britain can maintain the illegal uh, uh, legislation that was imposed by the occupying forces, which essentially open up Iraq's economy to a foreign takeover. And the Iraqis obviously don't like it, so they're trying to reverse it. And the United States are trying to force them to keep it. And that struggle will go on. Uh, but that's, you know, it's so typical that uh, and for anyone who knows any modern history, this is kind of like a footnote. You know, it's exactly what you predict. It's exactly what always goes on. And for and it's rational. You know, it's not surprising. It's what you'd expect if you're rational. It's what you always do. And the same is true in every other case. It's interesting that the more uh, honest scholars who advocate all of this, you know, the people who are really directly involved in it, they sort of conceded. They regard it as what they call a double standard, or a paradox, or an inconsistency. I mean, the paradox is that uh, the, the powerful states uh, have a rhetorical stand, which, they, which is always inconsistent with their actual practice. And that's a strange paradox, which you need kind of deep uh, th thinkers to explain. That's why you have fields like international relations theory and so on, to try to explain this strange paradox uh, that people uh, produce uplifting rhetoric and then act in different ways. It's so, like we don't think it's paradoxical when Stalin did it. So Stalin was full of the most uplifting rhetoric about democracy and freedom and so on, but acted in different ways. And we don't have an academic discipline that tries to look into the deep reasons why this might be true. But in the case of our own elites, uh, you can't just say what's obvious. You don't have to say it. Uh, so you need uh, intellectual disciplines to sort of cloak it in complicated uh, polysyllabic rhetoric and so on and so forth. That's why people go to graduate school to internalize that kind of way of avoiding dealing with the real world. Okay, we'll take a couple of final, if no one agrees, a final couple of questions. Is anyone not coming yet who'd like to take a pop? The gentleman at the back. Professor Lomkowski, by the time the general elections in the United States took place, uh, the American public were pretty well aware of the, the justifications, the reasons and the grounds on which the United States of America uh, triggers, set up and triggers an engagement in war. They were revealed by the time the, the elections took place. I mean, most of the people got to know actually that most of those justifications were falsified and most of them were basically lies. Uh, could one in the context of the American policies, uh, in the American uh, elections, and probably most likely in the context of the next general elections in Britain, which are likely to be won by Labour, uh, could one possibly be justified in talking about a paradigmatic shift in political thought and political consciousness in such a way that thoughts and policies that probably a decade, 12 years ago, would have been condemned probably by a majority as being neo-fascist and being racist are now accepted as mainstream policies. I think it's the opposite. It's quite the opposite. Uh, for one thing, just about the, the facts about the American public, which as I say, we know a lot about because there is very intensive polling. Uh, one of the consequences I think that uh, Iraq was developing weapons of mass destruction and uh, had relations with Al-Qaeda and was planning more uh, attacks like 9-11. Uh, and you can understand why they believe it. Uh, the Senate Majority Leader, Bill Frist, uh, during the Condoleezza Rice hearings, said it straight out on the Senate floor. He said, well, you know, we have to uh, defend ourselves against countries that are developing weapons of mass destruction. 
planning the attacks on, uh, uh, on us like as are acted. And the press reports it in the interests of what in the profession is called objectivity. When you go to journalism school, you're taught you have to be objective. To be objective means you have to report what people in power say without any analysis or criticism. So like if you're objective in North Korea, you report what Kim Jong-il says and you don't comment on it. And if you're objective in Britain, you report what Tony Blair says and you don't comment on it. Maybe some commentary around the side does. Uh, but the, the net effect of all of this is the public basically believes it, about half, even after it's been officially rejected. Uh, as to the, uh, and in fact, those beliefs are highly correlated with support for the war, as you'd expect. So like if I believe the things half the public believes, I'd support the war too. Uh, but uh, uh, if you compare it with the past, I think it's the opposite of what you described. So take, say, the uh, election of uh, Richard Nixon in 1968-72. Uh, uh, I mean, at that time, uh, about 70% uh, of the public regarded the Vietnam War as, I'm quoting, uh, fundamentally wrong and immoral, not a mistake, 70%. Uh, no, among elites that was non-existent. So you can't find any, you can barely find any statement like that in the liberal media or liberal critics and so on. Uh, the most they could say is that it was a mistake, it's costing us too much, and so on. But for the public, it was fundamentally wrong and immoral, not a mistake. Nevertheless, they voted for Nixon. Uh, and uh, again, uh, you can understand why. Either just forgetting other issues, just on the war issue. I mean, he had a plan for getting the United States. He ran on the program of withdrawing from Vietnam. Okay. And he said he has a secret plan to do it. So, okay. uh, so even on that single issue, people voted for him. And remember, that was after uh, seven years. 1968 was after six years of war. Way worse than Iraq. I mean, the U.S. attacked South Vietnam in 1962, Kennedy. And it was a serious attack. You know, uh, chemical warfare, uh, millions of people driven into concentration camps. Uh, you know, American bombing by the U.S. Air Force. No protest, nothing here either. Uh, it was years before any protest developed. By the, year it by the time it developed, South Vietnam had been practically destroyed. Uh, and uh, even then, uh, the kind of uh, doctrinal system had shifted the discussion to the bombing of North Vietnam. The peace movement went along with that. So most of it was a protest against the bombing of the North which was bad, but a peripheral issue. The main issue was the destruction of the South. Uh, and, you know, that has, uh, but even after years and years of war and practically the country practically destroyed, and, you know, no pretense about, barely a pretense about defending them from anyone, not like Iraq or overthrowing a tyrant, you know, nothing to cover it up, just straight invasion and destruction and massacre. Virtually no protest. When it developed, it was against a serious, a side issue. And the uh, uh, worst gangsters were elected. I mean, there's been a lot of progress since then in public attitudes. So I, I think it's the opposite of what you do. I mean, the way it's presented to us is what you describe, but I don't think that's what happened. In fact, protest against the Vietnam War was so slight, even at its peak, that to this day, Almost no one knows that South Vietnam was the main target of the attack, not North Vietnam, because there was no protest against it. I mean, in England, protest was so slight. I can tell you from personal experience that uh, uh, the, the person who sort of ran, really ran the international peace movement and almost totally ran it in England was Peggy Duff. Uh, if she wasn't a militant kind of woman, she would have gotten 25 Nobel Peace Prizes but she was excluded because of those characteristics. Uh, but she basically ran it internationally and in, the, in, in England almost totally. Uh, she had to bring people in from the United States, like me and Izzy Stone, to give talks at public meetings in London because she couldn't find any well-known British figures who were willing to do it. 
I mean, a lot of them were against the war, but they didn't want to, you know, it's kind of like undignified to stand up in a public rally and oppose it. So uh, that's, I mean, I, I was in Oxford in 1969, you know, when by then it wasn't even an issue, it was Locke Lecture. And I spent uh, practically every night giving talks at houses you know, around Oxford to student uh, colleges. And uh, you know, I, I asked the people, well, what are you asking me? And you've got a whole left-wing faculty here, you know, members of the Communist Party and so on. They wouldn't do it. I mean, it's just, you just don't do that kind of thing if you're in the British elite. Uh, but, uh, uh, just, but, you know, even in 1969, the protest was sort of generated from the outside to a large extent, or from popular movements, of course, they were always doing. And now it's different. It's not wonderful, but it's better than it was. If you think about it, the Iraq War was unique in the history of Europe. Hundreds of years of history. Try to find an example. I think this is the first time in the whole history of European violence, which conquered the world, uh, that a, a major war, any even a minor war, was protested massively before it was undertaken. I, I can't think of an analog to that. I can just say that on the, the biggest demonstration ever against the Vietnam War in London, I was on it with a hundred thousand people. The big demonstration against the war here, the goal was two million people. Next, um, sorry, Idrissa, then the final question. Okay, okay. I want to ask about the elections again, <laughs> given that I mean, the elections are coming up over here as well. Uh, yeah, so I just wanted to draw a parallel between what happened, what probably will happen now, and what happened in the U.S. elections. Uh, given the amount of resentment that there was against the Bush administration. And uh, then the opposition to the Bush administration was uh, seen as not being too different. So, and then people, I mean, the leadership on the left, uh, in a way, uh, threw the weight behind, uh, not exactly threw the weight behind Kerry, but advocated that, I mean, Kerry should be like, uh, they should vote Kerry just in order to get uh, Bush out. But the question is that uh, given that at the beginning, there were almost 35% people who wanted Ralph Nader to run. And uh, later on, I mean, I feel that uh, it could have, this was a moment when some kind of a third party movement could have developed if all those voices had been taken into account. Instead, I mean, those were, those felt marginalized and they felt that uh, they could not make a difference. Right? You see, 35, uh, you know, maybe 100% wanted Nader to run, but probably 100% would want uh, Mickey Mouse to run. Uh, just because they think the system ought to be open, it doesn't tell you anything about support. Uh, their support was very slight. And if you want to build a third party, I mean, I, I think it makes sense to develop a third party political alternative, but you don't do it by showing up every four years and saying, vote for me. I mean, if, you, if you're seriously interested in developing an electoral alternative, you do it every day. So say in Brazil, a much more democratic country than England or the United States, uh, there is a independent alternative. I mean, you can criticize it or dislike it or whatever, but the Workers' Party, whatever you think about it, is a mass political organization. And it's working every day, you know, locally, regionally, uh, a variety of issues, uh, all kind of participation and so on. Uh, the uh, Landless Workers' Movement, which is the most important popular movement in the world, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of people is out there every day. Uh, doing everything from taking over uh, uh, unworked un land for landless workers and fighting off the police and getting killed and so on, to building cooperatives and setting up a social system and so on. That's democracy. And that doesn't exist and barely exists in the United States and England. And on the basis of that kind of democratic participation, constant democratic participation, you can develop electoral alternatives. In fact, in Brazil, they were powerful enough to win the presidency. Uh, but it's not something that happens by showing up once every four years, saying, vote for me, and then going off and doing something else. So the Nader campaign was not a serious political alternative. It's coming out of nowhere. Uh, there is a party that does try to work regularly, the Greens. But he sent whatever you think about him again. But, you know, he just treated them with contempt. His attitude toward them was, well, you can endorse me if you like, or else get lost. 
uh, that's not a reasonable political alternative. So the actual choice uh, came down to something complicated. In the United States, elections are extremely limited. Uh, most, in Congress, very few seats are even up for election. The incumbent always wins. So they're fixed seats. That's partly because of uh, gerrymandering, in other way, they've drawn the district so that the incumbents win, uh, and partly just because of funding. The, uh, the, the, the candidate who receives more funding almost invariably wins in the United States. You can predict it with close to 100% accuracy. Uh, so mo Congress is barely contested. Uh, and in the uh, uh, presidential elections, it's like flipping a coin. Uh, Kerry got 29% of the electorate, Bush got 31%. Uh, slight difference Kerry would be in. So the issue, and most of the states were safe states. They were going to go one way or the other, no matter what you did. Uh, so the only issues arose in what are called the swing states, you know, like where it was sort of balanced, where the coin was not too biased when you flipped it. Uh, and uh, in those states, the reasonable position, I think, and my position, was that in those states you should vote against Bush uh, because the party positions are not identical. The uh, Bush positions are much more dangerous, uh, both for the world and for the general population. So keeping the worst out and leaving a little space for work for the future makes sense, I think. Uh, the, uh, in the safe states, you could do anything, vote for Nader, vote for the Greens, and not vote as a protest against the absurdity of the whole system, or whatever you felt like doing. Uh, the, uh, and what, what actually happened, you know, it, 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 it's a little bit of an error to talk about elections in November. There really weren't any elections. I mean, we don't call it elections when they had an election in Russia under Brezhnev. Yeah, they had elections, and people pushed and things. Uh, but it, uh, the elections are run very explicitly by the public relations industry. I mean, it's not a secret. You know, they're given the task of selling candidates. And they do it exactly the way they sell toothpaste. I mean, if you turn on and see an ad on television, you don't expect to be informed. You know, what you expect to be is deceived. The point is to deceive the public. That's a major task of business. Business, contrary to again what you learn in economics departments, business despises markets. They're afraid of markets, they hate them, they want to destroy them. In economics courses, they give you slogans about informed consumers making rational choices, but business spends hundreds of billions of dollars a year to prevent that. They delude you, and the same with elections. So people had no idea what the candidates did. It was just which image you prefer to be deluded by. Do you like uh, uh, John Kerry, you know, goose hunting and driving a motorcycle, or do you like uh, George Bush uh, living on his fake ranch that they built for him and sleeves rolled up and sort of ordinary guy? But, you know, it's not an election in any serious sense. I think we have to go. Um, I promised you a question, but um, I'm told that we have to vacate this room fairly quickly. Um, thanks very much indeed, Noam Chomsky, for coming and speaking to the press conference. All the tickets for the events in Edinburgh were sold out a long, long time ago, um, and I've been offered family pets and various things in order to provide tickets. It's not possible. Thank you very much, Noam Chomsky. Thank you. Thank you.